Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Today I would like to introduce Anne-Marie Nickel, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Nickel, I suppose I should say. Anne-Marie's research focuses on the communication of complex scientific and public health information to a range of audiences. Her work is multidisciplinary, crossing the fields of epidemiology, toxicology, social marketing, risk perception, and risk assessment. Her particular areas of focus are environmental and occupational exposures that impact health. She's worked at a number of different agencies, including the Occupational Health and Safety Association for Healthcare, the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health, and the BC Center for Disease Control. She's also worked in this, as an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia in the schools of environmental health and population and public health between 2007 and 2013. Uh, Anne-Marie does not have on here that she also leads uh, the CAREX team. And I'm not sure if that'll come up today, but it's a, it's a big project that's currently housed out of SFU. So welcome, Emery. And, and so currently I am also an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University in their Faculty of Health Sciences. So um, having spent much of my time here and getting my PhD here, I'm very excited to come back and talk about some of the work that I've been doing recently. So this is work that's supported by the National Collaborating Centers for Environmental Health which is one of six centers that's funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And our mandate there is to translate knowledge or information about new and emerging issues uh, to public health. And so we are one of six centers and our focus is on environmental health, which is what has brought me to the topic of hydraulic fracturing. And at, at the NCC, we try to be responsive to the public health community. So we started to get queries a couple years ago from people in public health regarding the issue of hydraulic fracking. What, what was hydraulic fracking? How could public health professionals respond to community concerns? And so this led to a project um, initiated by a number of other people where we started to look at what the potential interface was between um, the technology of, of hydraulic fracturing and what it might mean for public health in Canada. So I'm just going to start today with a bit of an outline about what hydraulic fracturing, ac fracturing actually is because when I started this project I had no idea and I was quite surprised. So I thought I'd um, share that with you. And I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the areas where there is some limited evidence about how hydraulic fracturing impacts community health. That's in the areas of water, air, contamination and then there's community concerns. Um, but, and then I'm going to focus on seismic issues because that's the part that really interested me and the part that I found quite surprising and it's also the part that in British Columbia we're actually on the leading edge of research looking at the relationship between shale gas extraction and earthquakes. But just to begin, what is shale gas? Shale gas is essentially methane that is trapped underground in layers of shale. And we use this, we use natural gas in Canada a lot for, for heating our homes. So most of you probably have a natural gas furnace in your house. It's not used so much for vehicles. Um, there are natural gas buses, but they're not very common. It's used in industrial and commercial sources. So it is a, a fuel that we use um, in our homes and in other places. And historically, I'm not supposed to, I, I'm going to try and go over there, but I'm going to try and use the screen instead. So, so just the difference between what shale gas extraction is and what we used to do is everyone's idea of oil, I think, comes from the, you think about Texas and they used to drill down in the ground and then the oil would come burbling back up and, and then, you know, and then it would be gone. And the whole peak oil idea that somehow we would use up these pockets of oil or natural gas that was in the ground was a, a big, our big understanding of fossil fuel resources. But that shifted in the 80s when they started to learn more about the resources that were trapped in the different layers of rock underground. So we've switched from having these easily available and cheap to extract pockets of oil and gas. And actually natural gas used to be something that they thought was a contaminant and they burnt off as a problem. It was the oil they were looking for, but over time they realized that that gas was important and saleable. So now what they do is rather than this process, we do unconventional. So this was called conventional oil and gas. This is now called unconventional oil and gas. And it's a process by which they drill down quite
we were going to run out of gas um, is actually an old idea. There, there is the province of BC alone estimates we have enough shale gas for another 150 years. So there's a lot of this potential uh, in Canada, particularly in British Columbia and in Alberta. So shale gas comes from something called a shale play or shale basin, and you can see it's the eastern part of BC and the western part of Alberta, and also the, a lot of Saskatchewan and Manitoba has the opportunity, although most of the work has been done in Saskatchewan, in part because it's spilled over from North Dakota. So North Dakota was one of the places that hydraulic fracturing really took off, um, and that spilled over into the back and shale in, in Saskatchewan. So a hydraulic fracturing operation is not a pretty thing. It sits on the top of the surface, um, and it doesn't look like a, necessarily look like a conventional oil rig. So this is what you would see in Pennsylvania. I also have a picture here. This is what it looks like in Alberta. And again, the difference is that there's actually many wells that are drilled down, and then uh, almost two to three kilometers, and then they go out two to three kilometers. So they have a low surface footprint, but they also go deep and far underground and can stretch out significantly. And it's usually not just one wellhead. There's a bunch of wellheads on a well pad. So that's what this is called as a well pad. So this is, again, a relatively new technology. And it, it's, also, it's also called multi-stage hydraulic fracturing because they keep doing it. So they keep these wells that can operate for 20 to 30 years. So they keep pushing the fluids down with more chemicals and pushing them out farther and breaking the rock and then sucking the gas as it comes back up. And unfortunately, the statistics around what's going on in Canada are pretty hard to find and pretty hard to nail down. So the best place to find information is the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And this is just um, a, an illustration here to show you that fracking really did kind of take off in 2006, particularly in Texas, because that's where the technology was developed. And it's, um, it now is the predominant way that shale gas is extracted in the U.S. and there's many, many billion cubic feet of, of shale gas that is actually drawn out of the United States now. So overall, if you look at the general public perception of fracking, and the industry doesn't really call it fracking, in fact they spell it a different way, it's F-R-A-C-C-I-N-G, they mostly call it hydraulic fracturing or they re refer to it as unconventional oil and gas extraction but the public has latched onto this term fracking and there's a lot of concern overall there's many many documentaries on fracking I, try, I caught up with one last night called Fractured Land that is actually about British Columbia that is quite interesting and the tension between the First Nations communities and what's going on in the northeast of BC but the general public perception in the beginning was that it was really bad for water and one of the first um, documentaries that came out called Gasland spent a lot of time showing how people could light their water on fire. And this sort of galvanized concern about the relationship between the fracturing of the rock and contamination of aquifers. So that was one of the first things that we looked into at the NCC was what is the potential for this technology to impact people's water. And the water use is not insignificant, and this is a big difference between what happens in the United States and what happens in Canada. As we went along, our learning expanded to realize that in the U.S., they use about 3 million gallons per well that's fractured of water. In B.C., we use up to 20 million gallons of water. And if you think about what happened last summer in terms of a drought in this province, the idea that the quantity of water is significant suddenly comes into put to play as well because we're realizing and it's not just the water and the stuff that's added to the water, but it's the sheer volume of water that's being used that is contentious. And there, there is a First Nations community that is quite concerned about water quantity as well as water quality. So there are some big differences is what's happening between Canada and the U.S. In part, our rock here is harder. So it's harder to get down into the ground. The shale wells are deeper. And they require more water and more pressure. And that's led to the differences to not only in water use, but how the seismic impacts have evolved as well. So the earthquake potential changes as a result of the fact that the technology is a bit different here. There's something called a frac focused database. So a lot of concern emerged about what was in the water. And you may hear a lot about the thousands of toxic chemicals that go into fracking fluids. And there are many, many things that are available to go into that water. Usually it's in a very small proportion. It doesn't mean that there isn't a lot used. If you've got 20 million gallons and only 1% of it uses some kind of flocculant, that's still quite a bit that goes into that. And if you want to know more about what's in a well, this is a publicly available database that does tell you all the different chemicals that are put into the, the fluids. Many of them, are, though, are considered proprietary. So you may run into this information review claim exemption 
if you're trying to dig deeper into what's actually in that well water, and some of it is considered proprietary. So when we started to investigate whether or not fracking actually contaminated groundwater, you soon realize that the fracturing that's done, this is, this is the fracking part. Fracking is only one piece of a very long, much longer process of extracting shale gas out of the ground. So it starts with mixing, then they drill a well, they push the water down, they fracture it, the water comes back up. So the potential for the fracking process, because it's so deep, to actually hit aquifers is very low. And to date, there is very little evidence of communication between fractures themselves and aquifers. So the industry has been able to say that there really is no relationship between fracking and water contamination. But that's not the end of the story. The well itself, the integrity of the well or the well bore, this is what this is called, can degrade over time. And there's, there's the potential for leaks and spills all along this process. So as the, the shale gas comes back up, there's it's called flowback and produced water. It's often put in holding pits. These can leak. The linings can break. There's trucking issues. So the potential for contamination of groundwater actually goes up significantly. And there's many, many, many wells. There's over 600 new wells each year in BC. So the, just the sheer volume of fracturing that's going on, it increases the potential for those leaks and spills to occur as well. The other issue that goes on in the process of shale gas extraction is what do you do with all that water when it comes back to the surface? And a lot of it, historically in the United States, has been put back down into what's called deep injection wells. So I'll show you that in a minute. But they're drilled often even deeper. So this diagram here doesn't, this is not a great picture, but it shows that it's, they push this water down even deeper, and they hold it in the ground with pressure over time. And this is not unique to shale gas. This is done also with um, oil, traditional oil, other kinds of fuels, nuclear repositories. This is not an uncommon technology. It's just that it, once again, because there's so much water and so many new wells, there's so much more waste to deal with. Now here in BC, they're actually trying some different things. They're recycling a lot of that water, um, which is taking pressure off of the water quantity problem. Um, but how, how effective that, that is, I haven't actually seen any clear data on the effectiveness of that at this moment in time. But it is a new technique that's being tried, recognizing that this deep well injection technology has problems of its own. So is there evidence that people's drinking water is being contaminated? It's actually quite rare. In Pennsylvania, they have found that methane concentrations are higher in people who live closer to wells. Also in, in the Barnett Shale in Texas, there is some evidence that private well waters located closer to active natural gas wells have increased levels of contaminants in them. But one of the big problems is we don't have a lot of baseline monitoring data. So before those wells were drilled, they didn't go in and take samples of people's water. And without that, it's really hard to attribute the relationship between what's in someone's well and the, and the fracturing activity that's going on. We do know, though, that spills and leaks occur. There are databases that actually co collect information on leaks and spills that you can look at. And some of them are fairly high profile. So there was a big one in 2012 in Alberta that contaminated about five hectares of land from flowback spilling out of barrels. So these things do happen, and there are databases that collect information on that. So just to give you a sense of what this injection well or the deep, the, the deep well process is, is that the, wa the wastewater can either be recycled or injected back into the earth. And the deep well injection is really quite cheap. They just dr dig a hole, pour some cement down, and then push the, the uh, wastewater down. So this is used quite heavily in the United States, particularly in Oklahoma. It receives quite a bit of the, of the fracking fluids from other states as well. But it's, it can be risky. Over time, a lot of that material is corrosive. It's salty because the, the, it collects salt from, from the underground and brings it to the surface. It can also contain radionuclides, radium, and off-gas radon. So there's, there's problems with this stuff over time, making sure that it remains in that waste well. So just turning to air emissions, so that those were issues around water. So we were surprised that the fracking itself didn't necessarily cause water contamination, but that other processes around shale gas extraction could, could contaminate water. We also learned that air emissions really vary depending on at what stage you are. So drilling a well, building roads, those cause curse certain kinds of air contaminants. The flowback releases the different kinds of gas products. You're going to see BTEX and um, different kinds of uh, volatile organics. There's a lot of diesel exposure because there's a lot of trucks. 
and that's a concern for community members. There's also a lot of silica. And then there's hydrogen sulfide that comes up with some of the gas, if it's sour gas, and has a lot of hydrogen in it, and that can be acutely dangerous to human health, particularly for workers. And then the methane itself is also, if it escapes, is considered a problem around, uh, it's a greenhouse gas as well. So there's a lot of air emissions, but they really do um, fall into which category of production or stage at which the well is operating. And one of the most vocal and uh, focal points of concern is the, is the very flaring and venting that happens. So when a lot of that gas comes up back to the surface in the beginning, you can't sell it because it's contaminated with many of the chemicals that they put in to fracture the rock. And so it's flared off or vented. Or if it builds up, they're going to vent and flare. And this is considered a good way of getting rid of excess or problematic hydrocarbons. But in and of itself, it also causes air pollution problems too. So there, there again has only been small pockets of research. They have found that people have irritation and bronchial or air symptoms, air-related symptoms, the closer you are to a flaring operation. That kind of makes sense. But again, the lack of baseline data and the lack of good monitoring really makes it hard to say what the actual impacts are. When they go into communities and they talk to people where the well pads are, they do hear a lot about concerns around noise and traffic. And again, that's because they have to build roads. It's a lot bigger trucks. There's a lot of trucks coming and going. And they also come with a lot of noise. So there is a, a growing area of concern around health impact assessments being done on communities where there are a lot of well pads. And then there's the occupational health risk. So we don't deal with this too much at the National Collaborating Center because our focus is on environmental health. But we do know that there are some major occupational exposures that are hazardous. So crystalline silica, which is a carcinogen, is a significant concentration. The Dr. Eswin in the United States has been doing extensive research on looking at how much silica, and, and that is used as a propent. They, they take the sand, or the very fine sand, and they put it down with the water, and it holds open those fractures. So once they crack the rock, the sand gets in there and allows the shale gas to flow back in and then flow back to the surface. So there's a huge amount of silica that's used. And actually, this has generated a whole new industry in sand because people are trying to make the right kind of propent for them to use in, in the fracturing wells. So NIOSH just did a recent review. They found that silica dust and noise were two major hazards at workplaces. There's also an AIHA white paper on occupational exposure. I'm not a member of the AIHA, but if you are, you can go in and look at the results of that white paper. And there's a bunch of resources here if you are interested in the occupational health issues. And this presentation will be available to people to follow up. So this is something that OSHA and NIOSH are interested in as well. I haven't seen as much information occupationally here in Canada, but I haven't been looking. So many, some of you in the room may know more about this than I do. When they look at, at, at the community, the psychosocial and socioeconomic community concerns, again, there hasn't been a huge amount of research. But we do know that in some places, people are quite happy to have hydraulic fracturing within their communities because they provide economic opportunities in areas where there hadn't been a lot of jobs. North Dakota is an excellent example of that. Um, there is both direct and indirect employment. So you see the, the sort of effect of there's people working and they need services and so the community grows. But there's also the boomtown effect that's happening as well. And we're seeing that in Canada in some places now referring to oil where communities were robust and thriving and all of a sudden the price of oil has caused this inc an incredible crash. In those. So the whole concept of a boomtown effect being associated with shale gas is probably very real. But there's not a lot of research going on in that area. Um, there's, there's a growing recognition of the impact of this technology on First Nations. And there is starting to be First Nations work specifically looking at oil and gas extraction and the role of First Nations communities in, in wells and what happens when First Nations resources are used for economic purposes. And it is, there's, it's a very complex issue. The documentary Fractured Land does do a really nice job of going over a lot of those points. And there has been research that's found that people that have um, fracking facilities in their region can be anxious, in part because they don't know what's going on. And there's often a lack of transparency about what's happening down the road. But again, there's really not a lot of research that's been done specifically on shale gas exposure. They have found that there are some self-reported 
uh, things like people talking about skin conditions and upper respiratory problems. Um, there have been some studies looking at fetal effects, so what happens to infants that are born to mothers who live near fracturing facilities. Um, they have a f mixed results, but there is maybe some small signals that there are some impacts. Um, but we really need better study designs and better exposure measures to link what's happening in the community to the well sites. So I'm going to leave water and community and air now and I'm going to move on to the seismic risks. So I just want to say to, to begin with that not all hydraulic fracturing operations cause earthquakes. Only some of them seem to, although the proportion of which is difficult to tell. I have not been able to see what proportion of wells have been associated with earthquakes. We just know that this happens. So because that process of hydraulic fracturing actually is there to crack the rock, it causes micro earthquakes. It's designed to crack rock. However, deep or shale, deep in the ground. However, that, that's not the issue. The issue is, is that over time, it appears that larger earthquakes are being associated both with hydraulic fracturing itself, so that's the research that we're doing here in Canada, and the deep well injection that's happening in the United States. And underground, as the pressure changes with those cracking in the rocks, slips of dormant or unknown faults can occur. And this is what they believe is leading to the larger earthquakes that are being talked about in the press. So there's been some really interesting research done here in BC. This is just a, a snippet of one of the articles that was put out. So I'm not sure if, if anyone noticed last December, but the Energy Commission, the Oil and Gas Commission, did come out and acknowledge that some of the earthquakes in northern BC are caused by fracking. And, and to date, Canada has recorded the largest fracking-related earthquake ever in the world. Um, and that, that was in Alberta, in Fox Creek. So we also recently had a big four-point, well, big. We had an earthquake here. Everyone felt that over Christmas, if people were here, that was about the same magnitude as the earthquakes that they're feeling in this region in Fox Creek. And when earthquakes happen now, there is policy to stop the fracking operation that's closest to it, to shut the well down, and then to go and investigate. And then they spend some time to see whether or not that earthquake was actually attributed to that fracturing event. So this is just some uh, an overview of the mechanics. I'm sure it, it's fairly obvious. You put pressure and fluid down into the ground. If you have a fault nearby, it can increase the pressure that's already existing in that fault. That fault can communicate with other faults around it, and this can cause shifts underground, both deep underground and at the surface, depending on where you're actually doing your drilling. So I'm just going to go through a few slides that um, were part of that article that I showed you to begin with. And I actually, when I first started to do this, I called the authors of this paper because I'm not a seismologist nor I'm, or a geologist and I don't know a lot about earthquakes. So I read the paper and it occurred to me that what he was trying to say was that there are more earthquakes as a result of fracking and that they're getting bigger over time. So I, I finally found the authors and I sat down and I asked them these questions and they're like, yes, that, that is true. The answer to your questions are yes. There are more earthquakes, they are associated with fracking and they are getting bigger over time. So this, I'm just going to walk you through the evidence. So this is where in British Columbia this research was done. It's called the Etcho region. This shows in 2002, this was not an aseismic region, so there have been little earthquakes in that area. Or, or, or tremors, They're, they were small, two to three magnitude. But by 2011, the number of little earthquakes per month had increased quite a bit. So from 24 in 2002 to 2003 to 131 in 2011. So this is that same region, the star is where the, the wellheads are. And you can see this is, this is the activity on the ground and just underground that's related with the fracturing operation. So this is when the fracturing operation was happening and this next piece is almost a month after. They could still actually see movement underground that, that they attributed to the fracking itself. And this, this demonstrates, so the yellow lines here are fracking. So in 2002, yes, this, there were some underground movements. But by 2006, 2007, when the fracking really got going, you can see there's more earthquakes happening and they're getting bigger over time. So you're starting to see a dose response relationship between the magnitude of the earthquake and the, just the amount of fracking itself. 
And the other thing that they determined down here, this shows you the relationship between the amount of water that's used and the size of the earthquake over time. So as the volume increases, the injected volume increases, so do, too does the capacity for or the magnitude of the earthquake. So the amount of water that's going down into the ground seems to be an important variable for causing seismic activity. And so these guys have continued to do other articles. And if you are interested in this, th these are some of the main authors in this region. This has led to what's called the Canadian Induced Seismicity Collaboration. This is a very new group. And they have a number of different projects. Um, there are researchers from all across Canada that are now part of this. Many of them are seismologists and geologists as well. So I just put this link up there to show you if anyone's interested in digging into this issue more. So our, this relationship between volume and earthquakes is, was not um, unknown. So in Texas, they realized that in, injection volume increases the number of earthquakes quite a bit as well. So they've been tracking earthquakes since 2007 and looking at water volume. And again, there is this clear trend of increasing earthquakes with the amount of water that's being used. So Oklahoma is one of the places where they'd started fracturing and, and they did a lot of this deep well injection and they started to really see. So Oklahoma had been really aseismic. It's not a place known for earthquakes. Tornadoes maybe, yes, but earthquakes not so much. So from 1978 to 1999, they'd had just about two a year. Oklahoma now has more earthquakes than California does. It records more earthquakes than California. So this is just a snapshot. The first five months of 2014, they had over 141 earthquakes in one region of Oklahoma. So this has become such an issue in Oklahoma that public health has started to really get engaged to the point where they're actually warning people. Um, they're asking people to buy earthquake insurance, which wasn't necessarily something that people were particularly interested in. And the earthquakes that are happening in this region come in swarms. So just, just a couple weeks ago, actually, in early January, they had swarms of 4.6 and 4.4, so about the size that we were seeing here um, that happened in Oklahoma. So they've actually taken about $1.4 million from the emergency fund in Oklahoma and moved that to public health to start to grapple with what are they going to do about the impact of these earthquakes on communities. Because they are, again, the US Geological Society has warned them that these earthquakes are going to get bigger and be more frequent over time. So in order to start to look into how to prepare for this, they've started out this earthquakes in Oklahoma consortia of different. So it includes um, two geologists, a clerk, a geoscientist and a lawyer is what they've done with their money because people are starting to sue because they're concerned about the damage that's happening to their homes. So this sort of led, has led me to wondering what, what is the role of public health in this whole shale gas extraction issue and, and should, should public health have a larger role for intervening? And one of the things that I think we could be thinking about, and we're lucky in BC so far because a lot of the drilling activities have not been near dense urban centers, but that's not the case in the US. In Texas, they have this phenomena in California of urban drilling. So those drilling sites are very near people's communities. In Canada, so far, we haven't seen urban drilling, but proximity does seem to be a significant um, distributor to localized effects. And then knowing what we know now about earthquakes and that the larger earthquake possibility is, is very real. Sorry, Sarah. Um, what, what are we doing to ensure that those communities are safe structurally, um, especially in remote communities where housing might not have been built to code? A lot of the buildings, this building that we're in here is probably built to withstand an earthquake of a certain level. But whether or not First Nations housing is built to withstand earthquakes of a certain level, I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. That would be a good question to ask if you were about to start a drilling operation with a First Nations community not by, nearby. And then who pays for the damage? If your community is damaged by an earthquake, or if your hospital, or your power lines, or a pipeline ruptures, who's responsible for that? And in, the insurance commissioner in Oklahoma is encouraging people to buy earthquake coverage. And in Oklahoma, a lot of the, home, the homes aren't built to withstand earthquakes. It's an aseismic region. So they're finding a lot, a lot of damage like this, where the bricks that were used to build houses, people's houses are falling down. So just focusing on earthquake damage, you know, one of the things that I would like to see is whether or not we could do things like seismic infrastructure sensitivities. So if you were to build a well, maybe you'd want to go and look around and say, what buildings nearby are sensitive? 
How is our hospital built? How are our roads? What, what are some of the things that if earthquakes are going to happen as a result of this drilling operation, what are some of the things that we could be thinking about? How do we prepare communities for potential impact of earthquakes? We do a lot of shakeout stuff here in Vancouver. I don't know how well that's done in other parts of the country though. And that we do need to be anticipating the future. Gail Atkinson, who's part of that induced seismicity network, has said that their conclusion is that in certain areas where the activation probability is high, so that means where there's faults underground, the hazard could be greatly amplified by hydraulic fracturing activity. So it's possible that we will see bigger earthquakes continuing. And I, I think that we really need to think about some of the other major infrastructures that are nearby fracturing facilities. So there are large dams in the northeastern part of BC. And are we considering whether or not those dams are close to hydraulic fracturing facilities? And I, I recently did find out that is one of the things that they are looking at, which is great news. Um, in the United States, that might not have been the same. They have fractured under the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. They have had to shut it down as a result of earthquakes at one point in time. They're now fracking under the Pittsburgh airport. To me, it doesn't seem to be a very wise thing to do to fracture under an airport, but I, that's just my personal opinion. But thinking about what things are nearby, those many kilometer radius underground doesn't seem to be an insensible thing to do. So overall, the relationship between public health and shale gas extraction has a number of variables, one of them being proximity. The closer your people are to those well activities, the more likely they are to be impacted. And that's, we really don't have a robust data set yet. There hasn't been a lot of research that's been done, but it makes sense that that is one of the main variables. But we need better research in order to make this claim. The geology is important, but the fracturing that happens in Canada is different from the fracturing in the States. Due to the geology, the more water that's used, and that has its own set of resource issues and public health implications that come along with it, including the potential for earthquakes. The stage of production is important. So if you are designing a study and you want to look at certain air emissions, you would want to make sure you're monitoring capture that particular phase of production. And then the intensity, so just sheerly how many wells there are in, in fracturing facilities are often very dense and there's lots of wells. And that is one of the big differences between conventional and unconventional oil and gas is that there's just a sheer volume of wells that it takes to extract the shale from the ground. So there's lots of research gaps. We really need better epidemiologic studies both for workers and for communities. We need better baseline data before those wells are built so that we can compare and contrast the out outcomes. And we need Canadian specific research because it is different here in Canada. It's different from what's going on in the United States. So I just thought I'd show you so if people are interested in following up. How's my time, Sarah? Good. So if people are interested in following up, there are BC and Alberta resources. So there has been a, a human health risk assessment that was done on oil and gas in general for the province by a consulting company called Intrinsic. So if people are interested in that, they're welcome to go look it up. It did not include seismic impacts. It did not include issues pertaining to water. It really did just focus on air in part because that's where they had data for, um, but if you're interested, that is available by the, from the province. The BC Oil and Gas Commission has maps and GIS layers and other information that people could use. It has an incident map that does show where some of the spills and pipeline problems are, if you're interested in looking that up too. Alberta also keeps its uh, information repository. They have a groundwater observation well network that is quite extensive. And they also keep track of their earthquakes and put them up on this, what's called a compliance dashboard. So that the, the recent earthquake in Fox Creek, it's up there. They explain what happened. They, ask, they asked the company to shut the well down. They did an investigation. And that information is provided on this compliance dashboard. Another great resource is the US Geological Society. They've been studying this for a while. In part because induced seismicity, which is the uh, sort of science speak for earthquakes that are caused from uh, oil and gas extraction, amongst other things, uh, induced seismicity has been studied for a while because it's been used in other technologies. So geothermal power does this, as well as, as conventional oil and gas. So they've been studying this for quite some time. And they have a whole section on myths and misconceptions and frequently asked questions that's quite useful. So I'm going to stop there, um, and I will try my best to answer your questions. Unfortunately, my co-author, Helen Ward, is not here. I don't think she's online. Is she either, Sarah? I don't think she works on Fridays, so she's not here today. Um, but um, I will hopefully I can answer the questions as best as I can. So thank you very much.
I expect we're going to have a lot of questions, so it's just where we start. Or maybe not. Um, so thanks, Emery. Fantastic um, presentation. So one of the clearest I've heard on the topic. So oh, thank congrats you. to you. Um, I'm just wondering about, um, you know, when you talk about sort of the larger role of public health, and, and this is really a, a question of sort of scope, but um, not so pertinent probably to BC, but when you think about like the Marcellus shale in the US, a lot of what that gas did was displace coal. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's been huge air quality benefits um, from that. Uh, so what's being burned for power generation being gas now instead of coal, there's clear benefits in terms of air quality and health from that. And I just wonder if you, what your take is on that in general, how that part of the whole fracking issue um, should be addressed and just whether you've seen sort of any good quantitative research on that. I'll, I'll try to. So, you know, so yes, that that is that comes up a lot. That issue is you know, shale is shale gas cleaner than coal, and there are some people who debate that. They say that because the methane leaks, because there's so many methane leaks and spills, that it, if you actually did a whole cost accounting of the technology, it may not be that much cleaner than coal in terms of air pollution. So, or sorry, in terms of greenhouse gas impact, in terms of air pollution, I, I agree. It is much cleaner to burn than coal and we reduce particulate matter. And th so the bigger debate too is, you know, what are we doing around renewable resources and versus fossil fuels? Because what, what this has done is it shifted, I think, a lot of the attention away from looking at renewables back to looking at something that's cheaper, cheaper and easier to go to the ground and already fits into a system that we're used to having. So I, I think that that is one of the things for me that is kind of too bad about all of this is that there is so much shale that's available that it's not going away as a technology. It's, it's kind of here to stay. And the idea that we have 150 years more uh, shale gas in the ground really, you know, what does that do to our turning towards solar and wind power as well, which we know very clearly does reduce problems with air quality. So I, I believe it's better, and I am, I am not an anti-fracker by in, in any state. Like I wouldn't stand up and say that, but I would say that it's a technology that I think it got out of the gate before they really realized what the implications were for it. And I think the earthquake thing is just the latest in a realization that, uh-oh, um, you know, what, what's going on with this technology and how can it impact people? So I, I think there are, and then, then there's like the price of oil and what's happened in Canada. Like we've, we've lost a significant industry in Alberta at this point in time due to the drop in the price of oil. And what we do have instead is shale gas. And a lot of, of the economics of BC are really hung on this idea that we can get natural gas out of the ground, we can liquefy it and sell it to other countries. And that, that is a big sort of economic dream that's happening right now that's predicated on this technology continuing in the province. I don't know if you had anything else to add. No. Hey, we've got fingers flying online okay, here, okay, so I'll, I'll get to some of the online questions. Okay. Uh, I think this is probably Paul Hasselbeck, and the question is, uh, thank you very much. Take us forward, and what should be put in place from a monitoring program and or for a monitoring program and surveillance activities. So, you know, what would be ideal here, I guess? Well, I think that probably the expertise for that probably exists in this room rather than for me in general. But I think we need to do continuous monitoring, not just grab samples. They need to be in the places where not just at the fences. So a lot of the the measurements that are done are just at the fences of the of the technology itself. So for communities, we need to have community monitoring so we know what actually is happening. Also, it's indoor versus outdoor. We know that there's outdoor air pollution, but does that migrate into people's homes as well? The indoor air environment, I think, also is one that's sort of not discussed. They are seeing in Pennsylvania increases in radon. So because they're destabilizing and changing things underground, the capacity for radon to seep up into people's homes. If you're having earthquakes, it doesn't seem unlikely that the footprint of your house could also crack again and allow radon to re-enter a dwelling. So that really hasn't been thought out too. So I think that we need a lot more continuous monitoring of both air and water and then some some real assessments of the seismic potential of these sites before they get going. Let's go look underground and see what's there before we start fiddling around with it. Okay, another online question uh, goes back to that of the flammable household water. Is that something that's been observed more or less over time as fracking increases? Do you know? What I know about that is that 
the, um, the person that made that documentary was heavily criticized for his use of the inflammatory visuals of people lighting their water on fire. It's quite spectacular to watch those videos. People do just take a, 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 um, a lighter and they turn their tap on and woof, it, things catch on fire. But whether or not that was those, the methane was already in the water before the fracking occurred is the question. And without that baseline measure, we don't know. So the people in the video assure everyone that this happened after the fracturing occurred, and that could very well be true, but it's hard to prove. And so if we want that evidence, if we want to be able to say that people's water is being contaminated, then we need that before and after in order to make that claim. I'll just make the comment as I'm walking across that, you know, you say that we have the expertise in this room, and I, I want my... Uh, five, six, seven students to take note because this will be the topic of their sampling framework study, what they will start in a few weeks. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the problems with respirable crystalline silica um, mm -hmm. from fracking operations and that some of that work was being done, I think, by, you said, OSHA mm -hmm. in the States. How would you characterize the degree of cooperation between, say, more public health oriented bodies like NIOSH or Centers for Disease Control and more occupational oriented bodies like uh, OSHA, do, do they cooperate well together? Are there gaps in there? Uh, and is the, is the distinction even a valid one? Well, I think that the, the magnitude of exposure for workers, because they are there at the wellheads, A, it's different. It's, so the profile of exposures is different. We're not discussing respirable silica in communities. Um, if there was a community right there, though, this is a this is a real picture of them loading stuff. I've seen p crazy pictures of people with no PPE loading the sand down into the wellheads. So it um, this is a real problem. And again, it is recognized by NIOSH and OSHA and the CDC. Um, I haven't seen a lot of cross discussion between public health and occupational health in Canada. Um, Lydia did uh, find a document that the AIHA had done that does include occupational and environmental issues together, recognizing that some of the air pollutants are probably similar at the wellhead and then downstream in communities, particularly NOx and SOx and those sorts of things that, that are standard monitored. But I think that there are particular occupational issues that, that are being looked at. Um, radon is another one, radon coming up out of the wellhead. They've had some studies looking at just the radionuclide exposure for people who are workers and what are we doing to, to address that issue. Um, particularly in that context. So um, I haven't seen a lot of cross-pollination personally, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And these, to me, indicate that at least in the US, there is discussions going on. I haven't talked to anyone at WorkSafe BC. So people here may know more about that, about what they're doing around um, health and safety of workers in the oil and gas industry and in, in the shale gas industry. I just I don't have the answer to that, but someone else may. Excellent talk. Thanks, Anne-Marie, for highlighting the uh, environmental community health impacts, public health implications of hydraulic fracturing. Um, Aaron's question about respirable silica does speak to the interest in this room of folks who are interested potentially about other occupational exposures. Um, so respiratory silica certainly is one of them. Um, uh, just even the fact that there's um, a large amount of vehicular and machinery um, traffic that goes on on sites is uh, a great deal of acute hazards associated with that and of course ergonomics with all the manual lifting of, of stuff on sites that's um, a great concern and also all the chemicals that are used and propens and acids and what and whatnot so much of that could um, uh, illuminate the flammability the the explosions that could be had on site. So it's lots of interesting topics, occupational exposure topics that you all can all, all look up. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, while, as you highlighted, there isn't a lot of urban fracking that goes on in Canada, um, it does make us think about then the vulnerable populations that are often in the remote rural settings, and they often are the First Nations 
uh, Aboriginal people. So there's a lot of also uh, careful, shall we say, political negotiations around industry, First Nations groups, and whatnot. So we might not think that that um, impacts us directly. Um, it does impact a lot of people uh, who live near those fracking sites. Um, and also the induced seismicity. I think even though there's not a lot of data, the fact that it's, it's being talked about and emerging evidence that comes of it, it could affect urban sites in that we just don't know what kinds of induced seismicity as a result of the deep well water injection and other activities associated with fracturing that could be happening. Is it very localized near those well bores, you know, those shale plates, or does it actually um, get magnified into other areas in a province like British Columbia or Alberta? So is it just a Fox Creek problem? Is it just a northeastern BC problem where the fracking sites are? I guess data will oh, I continue. don't think we know. We don't know. I don't think yeah. we know. Is Research the, gaps are huge. They are. Yeah. But it does highlight about our attention that needs to be made on earthquake resiliency as a whole. Especially in a, a place where we hadn't really thought about earthquakes in that context before. I mean, if anyone was at Semiamu, the, the conference, they, they were ta the keynote speak at dinner talked a lot about some of the, just the work pattern problems that happen in these wells because there's, there's contractors and subcontractors and, and just the health and safety regulations um, can to, to get water down to the point where accidents happen and they, they showed a fatality of people who, and there was a severely, people were severely burned in part because there was really nobody responsible for the safety of the workers at the site. And that's a whole other issue to think about is, you know, what are we doing to keep people from the wells from catching on fire and exploding? And that's not, that's not common, but these things do actually, these accidents happen as well in Canada and the United States. Okay, another online question. How responsive are the energy companies in addressing these concerns that you have raised? Well, if a, if an, so I can speak for that from an earthquake perspective. If the earthquake is above a magnitude 4, they have to shut down currently in BC and Alberta. I don't know how unique that is in terms of the level. In, in, in the United States, it might be a different magnitude, but right now they have to stop operating. Uh, the other emissions don't have the same kind of regulation, and I don't think the monitoring is there as well. So I don't know, but just in the terms of the of the earthquakes, and when even if you look up the articles in the news, you'll see they usually name the company that's had to stop operating. Sorry, I'm just trying to make uh, formulate this question. Health impacts on First Nations seem to be an area of concern due to the proximity of their communities to fracking operations in BC and known disease epidemiology and established environmental monitoring methods. The, the nature of the question isn't clear, but perhaps a comment on First Nations and, and if there's anything specific that we should be doing with respect to those communities. I think mo monitoring should be happening in those communities. I know there are some initiatives to try and get First Nations communities more engaged in oil and gas, and I think it's complex because there are some groups that are uh, very interested in the economic benefits of this, and there's other groups who are more concerned about the environmental. I don't think it's a homogenous response. I think each community has a, a different relationship to oil and gas development and extraction. Some people just have pipelines that go through their land that could interrupt the path at migration patterns and they can leak and spill. Other people generate revenue from the well sites themselves. So I think it's led to a, a very a fractured response from First Nations communities in general. I think that that's a tension. Again, that uh, fractured land was a very interesting video because it went through all of the different kinds of relationships that people can have and the, the dissent even within different communities about how this resource extraction should proceed. But again, a, a better monitoring and better awareness. Like are, are people going into those communities and looking for vulnerable buildings? That's what I would like to know. You know, can, can we say with any certainty that these, these public health facilities, these buildings, this church, this this house is going to stay standing up if these earthquakes get bigger. So I think that's a small thing that we could start with that everybody probably should be concerned about. Okay, if there's no further questions, I guess we can wrap up a little bit early today. Okay. And thank Anne-Marie again. Okay. Well, thank you for having me.